Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about passion in code. So let's get into it. So the question in question was, Frederick, is it true that software engineer, a software engineer's passions is, sh is, sh is shown in the code that they write? Sometimes, I usually say that there are two types. Um, of passion for software developers. You have tech passion and you have process passion, the types, where if you meet these people, depending on what stage of their career they're at, you'll see that they usually have inclinations. So the process passion people are usually the sort of people who will show a lot of enthusiasm around things such as, say, pair programming, mob coding, uh, documentation, um, anything related to Kanban, how you work with sprints or agile or things like that, basically work frameworks, how you actually like the social aspects or so forth, administrative aspects of the work. And then you have the tech inclined software developers, they usually are very much into highly advanced or like cutting edge, leading edge techniques, tooling, um, there's many flavors of passion if that makes sense. And so one of the things that I usually say is that the software developer, they usually go through stages of development and some never really fully grow up, but it is very much like growing up where you start out usually not knowing so much as a junior software developer and then you enter what I, what, well, it's not my term, but it's a good term, what I like to call the philosopher stage of your career where you start to in sort of realize that there are all these different ways of doing things and so forth and you start to be very usually to get experimental with ideas and concepts and things like that and then after a while you enter into the pragmatic master stage which is another term that is pretty useful where you're basically mature in the way that you do things. And the reason why these steps is fairly important to understand is because it helps you understand um, the source of developers that you're dealing with. And like when what is a net positive and what is a risk. You see, passion is a great thing, but it's also a dangerous thing the reason being because passion without skill and maturity, wisdom, all these sorts of things that happen after a while is usually something that leads to disaster for the net product because usually things fall, when you get too experimental with things you sort of see that things fall apart and this happens if for both types of developers you have people who do like you know, they talk about extreme programming, mob coding, pair programming, you know, we have to move slow so that we can move fast type of people. Like there's tons and tons and tons of these philosophies where you have to work in accordance with certain practices or follow some type of doctrine of work to do anything with these people. Now, that is true. Like I actually have had this conversation with many people before where I say that the there is no question in my mind that a level of process is necessary. Being on, it, on one of the extremes is silly, saying that no process is the best process versus saying that a lot of processes are like also the wrong idea because you're basically focusing on, the, you're not focusing on the goal, you're focusing on some doctrine that you're trying to follow, which is what usually people who do scrum, safe, like all these, like that, that's what they do. They simply follow a work framework because of the doctrine. They lack, on the other hand, the wisdom and understanding to understand where is the benefits coming in and where are what's the thing that's going to make a difference and what's the thing that is just going to be extra stuff that you need to take care of that distinction being able to sort of cut away the fat or cut away the excess from a process is something that happens when you enter the pragmatic master phase when you are a true master of process and then you have technical people who have exactly the same problem where you have a lot of philosophers, software developers who will use very advanced, you know, computer science concepts in a team with like all junior developers, or they will invent their own frameworks, or they will over engineer things, they will like rewrite code bases over and over in different stacks or change paradigms every other, every so often because they are falling 
prey to their passion. They are allowing their passion to, to go before the health of the overall system. What usually happens is that you end up with a very messy and horrible code base because it's basically just a, in a constant state of experiment, experimentation. So you never actually settle on anything that is stable and sort of works long term. And the same thing happens here, and the same thing happens when you become a pragmatic master. You start to realize that, well, there are some patterns or tools or things that are actually really useful, like new innovations or things like that, that will make a positive uh, impact. But there's not, you know, that doesn't mean that everything is necessary, and you start cutting things and trying to find the sweet spot of what do you need in order to end, to need uh, to sort of reach those, those end goals. And finding this balance in a, hum, in, in a software developer, I will say is probably the engineering manager's biggest challenge, hands down. Nothing is more difficult for the um, engineering manager. I mean, if we just set aside the fact that finding talented software developers at all is a challenge, this is the next one. And it comes down to, do you know how to tell if this is the right person to give this responsibility. That is the key thing. If you take a process passionate super freak uh, who really like, you know, they have all the right things, right? They, you love them, they're nice time, they have all this energy, like it's infectious, right? But if you put them in a team where they're gonna like not gonna get to do much or maybe their ideas are like they're gonna basically create a situation where they take over the entire team there's no balancing factor to them they might actually slow down the entire project because they lack the maturity to understand that yeah it's cool to play around with process but the deadline is still there and it's no not good if you just say that well we're following all these different frameworks and I'm sorry we're late all the time because you know we can't actually deliver due to the fact that I prioritize my passion as a software developer over the results and the goals of the company. That's actually very dangerous because you might have a really talented, super passionate software developer, but you're not left with any benefits from it because they haven't reached that point where they've truly matured. And on the flip side, if you take a super passionate engineer who's like really good with tooling and things like that, and you put them in another project, uh, or you put them in, uh, I've seen that, uh, this is like the normal case for me, uh, I see it at the very least. You take two random software developers, maybe they're very passionate, maybe not, and you have them build something from scratch. Usually they're of course consultants as well. and they work on that thing for a year and then the system turns out absolute shit and then I, as the sorry fucker I am, get to take over that project after management sort of realizes that this is unsta unsustainable and then I see what's been going on. Oh cool, they've this is their little sandbox. They have reinvented tools, they have changed paradigms a few times here. I see that there's no testing, like there's no thought on quality. They've just kind of played around with things that they thought was kind of cool and inspiring for the moment. So it's a bit like a, a fraternity type of situation. Yeah, this is like you, us just playing around. And that's also not good. So for the engineering manager, this is truly the really big challenge. Do you, it's not just about finding a passionate software developer, it is about finding a project where those passions stand in, like where, where this person's motivation and hunger and talent and all that stuff can be focused to gain you some type of benefits. Because if you mismatch the project or the task that you need from a person, and put them in the wrong situation. Even if they're really passionate and have all this hunger, you're still going to end up with a really shitty project. I even go as far as to say that one of the best pairings that you can do, which is saying a lot, uh, it's easier said than done in, as well, is that if you have, say, a philosopher software developer, it's really important to put them into a environment where they have at least one pragmatic master who has enough energy left to educate them into becoming pragmatic masters themselves. Because the passion is very, very powerful, it's very useful. The danger is that when you apply it blindly, it becomes like a purging fire type of thing, like it's just something that goes out of control. A little fire that is controlled and has, like, it's gonna make a world of difference, but if you just let it spread for like or all over the place, you're gonna end up with a disaster. So what I want you to take away from this is that yes, 
code shows passion among software engineers. You can usually see it, the you see it very quickly if you see a product which has you know all the bells and the whistles or like they're using their fancy advanced uh, uh, tactics or like you, there's always a flavor you can always if you go to the documentation section and you see everything is very very nicely documented and everything is like super super defined or you talk to the team and you see like they run like the full agile playbook or something like that you can sort of gauge based on how into this stuff they are who's sort of running the show in terms of like you, you very quickly figure out who is the one who's who created all this and you get that it's almost an energy level right you see that there's one or two developers or someone like that who really really burns for this sort of stuff they're usually very uh, easy to spot the same thing goes for with the coding where you see people do something advanced in the code or something like that and you can very quickly see who's been doing most of the more advanced design patterns or things like that etc etc they usually have some type of uh, connection with it. I mean, you can check the Git history and sort of start figuring some stuff out based on, well, if you have the experience to it. These are the things that you usually see with passionate engineers. The thing that I tell you is that the greatest challenge for a engineering manager is to leverage that passion without paying the cost of having that passion go out of control, which is the biggest challenge for the manager. Because with if you you want passionate software developers who will really keep up to date with the latest tooling and push things and be hungry and engage and put all, put all of this positive energy into your company and your projects, but if you let them just run wild, it is actually going to turn into a shit show for you many times because they're just going to do whatever they think is interesting or fun and not actually produce something useful or like sustainable for the company. So you're actually it, you're not gaining something from it, you're actually paying a cost. And I usually say to, say my argument is that companies who don't understand, understand how to pair up the right person with the right team or project or so forth, uh, they usually pay that cost in legacy code. That's the cost that you pay for training junior level developers and for training uh, like philosopher level pro programmers without a pragmatic master present. The problem is, and that's what every single engineering manager is just going to like, because I hope that they're nodding in agreement with every, most of the things I've said now. And then they're all going to say the one thing that I also know. Fre but Frederick, how do we get the pragmatic master? Because there's not enough of them. How do we find such a person? I go, yeah, I'll let you know when I figure that one out. Because you want to find one pragmatic master who can sort of train all these passionate developers from philosophers who cause a lot of damage if they're sort of unsupervised into really really good software developers and not pay all the problem uh, pay for all the problems that that has well yeah have a great day